Kevin Bacon. You heard of Kevin Bacon? Kevin Bacon is a big deal, is a big actor in Hollywood. Kevin Bacon is also a four-legged, 450-pound pig <laughs> in Wisconsin. I learned this week. <clears throat> in fact, Kevin Bacon was found in the backyard of a, a home in, uh, in, in, uh, in Wisconsin, in a neighbor's backyard. A um, neighbor called the cops saying, there's a big pig in my backyard hamming it up. <coughs> <coughs> and uh, the, the police came and uh, they did a search. They went around the, the neighborhood to uh, find out uh, who might own it. And uh, there was a pig farm up the road. And so they went into the farmer and said, uh, do you know, uh, have you lost a pig recently? And they would go out and they came back and said, yeah. Kevin Bacon's gone. <laughs> and uh, so they, uh, the farmer grabbed a bag of cookies and uh, went down and with the police to the house where uh, the pig was still in the backyard. And so he opens the bag of uh, cookies and starts laying them down so much, and, and he creates a path where the pig loves cookies, uh, apparently, and followed the cookies all the way back to the farm and to the pen. Uh, the, uh, they were able to lure him down the pathway with cookies. Jesus also has a way, has nothing to do with cookies, <laughs> but it's a way of living. And when he ca came along and, um, uh, and laid down and said, this is the way, we sang that earlier, he is the way, the truth, and the life. You want to know how to get to the Father in heaven? Is through through Jesus. So we've talked the last few weeks about the Jesus way. I want to finish it up. It's just a short three-part series that I was doing. The first week we talked about the path, that uh, Jesus is the way. And it was more than just a belief, but it was a way of living. Jesus called people to follow him, to follow that path. And then the second week we talked about the price. As Jesus made his way towards Jerusalem, um, there was some uh, antagonistic people that uh, started to uh, started to uh, attack him and uh, look for ways to kill him. And Jesus, <coughs> mount, noting the, the mounting pressure against him, uh, pointed it out to those who wanted to follow him and said, are you willing to count the cost? It's going to get difficult. And it reminded us today that there are sometimes there's cost to following Jesus. There may be some things that, that you want to do or some ambitions, and God says there's a, a better way. You just have to trust me in this. And it feels like we're giving up, but as we walk his walk, we find out that actually it's the best way. It's the blessed way. <clears throat> so that's the last couple of weeks, the path, the price, and then the position today. We're going to see one of the most important G things Jesus did was he showed us uh, a position, a position of, of servanthood, an attitude of the heart, a posture of, of lowering ourselves and honoring others, a servant. He said, this is the way, this is the way to live. You want to be a follower? You want to be an apprentice of mine? Learn how to serve. Uh, <clears throat> over the last many years, uh, in fact, it was a, one of the churches that had a big influence on, on me, and even giving me the courage to step out and start a church here in Stittsville, was a church by the name of Willow Creek and a leader named Bill Hybels. And uh, for 30 years, this church was maybe one of the leading churches in Inf most influential churches in North America. But back in 2018, um, things fell apart. There was a, a sex uh, scandal, first some allegations, and then other stuff came up. And, and everything started to fall apart. Um, and I was listening to a podcast this week uh, from the, the new current executive pastor there, uh, Tim Stevens. And he was talking a little bit about the history of the church and what they've endured over the last six years since things blew up. And he, he said, you know, the front line was all about the sex scandal, but he said the, uh, 
the truth is, underneath there was something uh, that was probably bigger, maybe not to the women involved, but it was, there was a big issue with power. And, <coughs> and I, as I listened to it, um, I was thinking, that is so opposite of Jesus. Um, one, of, one of the stories he, he told was just that, that I guess the senior pastor uh, the pr before this happened, to get into his office there was like three locked doors and a key card you needed to get in. It was like he was really isolated and removed from the people. And uh, one of the first things the new people did to rebuild trust was they got rid of the doors, opened things up, and, and uh, created a, an approachable environment. And it was just that isolation and that, uh, that the power uh, that was used was just so uh, un unlike Jesus, who was very available. In fact, when he asked people to follow him, they lived with him. They walked with him. Uh, they slept around the campfire together. It was like uh, there, was, there was this uh, closeness as they loved and served one another. It just seems so different than what happens in many churches and many relationships. And so that's why I wanted to close this series looking at probably the last lesson that Jesus wanted to instill in his followers before he went to the cross. There was a big deal that he, he, he uh, enacted. And uh, it, we read about this in this uh, uh, teaching moment that Jesus set up in John chapter 13. So allow me just to read through it. In John 13, beginning in verse 1, it says, It was just before the Passover festival. This would be 24 hours before the Passover. Uh, Jesus, on the Thursday night, met with his disciples, and they had a meal together. They celebrated it early. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. There are two things Jesus realized. That first of all, that he was leaving. It was time. The next morning, he'd be hanging on a cross. He knew it was time. And he also loved these people who had gathered around him, who had walked with him over the last three years. He was going to miss them. He loved them to the end. But it was time to leave. Life has a way of, you know, doing that sometimes. People we love leave sometimes. But Jesus' leaving was short-term, because he would be back. But he knew things would be different from this point on, after the cross. So he spent that last night with them eating a meal. It says in verse 2, the, the evening meal was in progress. And as they're eating, it says, and the devil, the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. One of the twelve. As they sat there eating this last supper together, Jesus knew one of them, one of his, one of the people he loved that his, was included in this meal that was, they were sharing together would betray him. And verse 3 says that Jesus knew the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. You see, in Jesus' mind, there was no question of who was in control and who had the authority and the power. God had put, think about that, God had put the, 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 all the power in the universe, like in, in, in Jesus. Everything was under his power stars and the orbits and like everything and that's what makes the next couple of verses so unbelievably shocking because it says so he got up from the meal took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist and after that he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples feet drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him this was the servant's job. And yet Jesus chose to do that job himself. 
Can you imagine the tension in the room? The disciples, I mean, if you had been there, what would you have done as you watched this? You probably could have heard a pin drop as they're all astounded. Jesus, what are you doing? Why are you down there? The next couple of ver verses I have, uh, <coughs> I went to artificial intelligence and I said, could you, could you write the next two verses or translate them into uh, the Gen Z language comment of the day? Just so Brody here, you know, who's leading music and some of these guys up here and Carson, so that they can understand these next couple of verses. And this is what artificial intelligence gave me. His squad, <laughs> his squad was tripping like, what's up with this Jesus? You're going to wash our feet now? That's not the way to do it. We should be washing your feet, right? Verse 7, but Jesus was like, next verse, verse 7, but Jesus was like, bro, bro, you don't even know what's up. But li later, you'll get it. Okay, now for the people who are a little older, but Jesus was saying here, <coughs> was he's saying to his disciples is, you will understand later. Later, you'll figure this out. You, you may not understand it right now, but you will when you see what happens in the next day. You think I'm going low now by wash, stooping low to wash your feet now? Wait till you see what happens tomorrow. Wait till you see me hanging from a cross. You'll understand this in a whole different light that I didn't come here to be served, but I came to serve. So Jesus, Jesus, um, Jesus gave his life as a servant, and he wanted them to get this picture of, of what life as a servant would look like. I uh, happened to notice, too, on my newsfeed uh, story came up and I had to look at it because it, it said that in Oklahoma there's this high school that was doing a fundraiser the students were licking toes that's right toes to raise funds for their school uh, at some fundraiser event and of course some parents saw this because the videos being posted and, and they were disgusted and they went after the school and and I thought you know that's not what Jesus had in mind when he said, I want you to wash feet, like that, you know, Jesus was, was going low, but he wasn't being gross, right? <laughs> but he wanted to, uh, you know, understand that he was re doing a role reversal, and he was here to serve. He was here to serve now. Well, Peter, Peter responded like most of us would respond. In the next verse, he says, you, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Now Jesus is starting to, to stretch this analogy a little bit different here because he's not just talking about literal water and, and washing feet anymore. And in fact, he, he says, you know, unless I wash you, in other words, unless I wash away your sins, unless I've forgiven you, You'll have no part with me. And he's, he's referring back to why he came and what he's going to do by going to the cross tomorrow and on the next day and dying. Unless I wash you. And what he's pointing out here is what you have to understand, Jesus, is you can't earn your way to heaven on your own. You can't be good enough. You need me to wash you. And just like I'm going to wash your feet, you need to be washed. Your soul needs to be washed. And so that, this analogy here has got kind of two parts to it. In fact, he goes on, then, Simon, the, then, the, uh, then Lord Simon Peter replies, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. And I, I wanted to do it all then. Because I want to be part of you. And Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. What Jesus is pointing out here is that once you've been bathed, once you've, your sins have been washed away, you've, you've been forgiven, 
of your sin, uh, you're clean. Like once a person decides, and it's by faith, right? It's by faith we choose and we come to Jesus and say, Jesus, please forgive my sins, and he washes it away, right? It's, a, it's an analogy of baptism. What, baptism is a picture of that also, that Jesus wants to cleanse you of all your sin. Now, on the road of life, you'll collect some dirt. There was dusty feet uh, from walking along, and we'll collect some other sin in life. Like, we'll make mistakes, and we'll dishonor, and we'll hurt people, and, and that happens in life. None of us are perfect. It's not like sin suddenly, once you're, you're baptized, once you become a Christian, you're perfect the rest of your life. <laughs> that doesn't happen, right? But, but Jesus says, but... I need to wash that off on a regular basis. Right? I need to wash your feet. We need to come before him and, and ask for forgiveness. I mean, we're clean inside. We, we're going to heaven, right? We're already clean, but, but stuff happens, like the dust on your feet that has to be washed away sometimes. And so you need to make it a regular habit of, of washing that away by repenting and that, saying, Jesus, forgive me for that sin. Help me not to ever do it again. And, and that becomes a regular practice. And then he goes on to say, um, well, the last phrase, can we go back to verse 10? I just want to highlight that last verse, because I haven't, the last sentence in there. He says, and you are clean, uh, though not every one of you. And so John needs to explain this a little bit further, because obviously everyone's wondering, like, what? What, what, what do you mean, one of us isn't? And he goes on in verse 11 to say, for he knew who was going to betray him, and that is why he said, not everyone is clean. This is the second reference now to Judas, who would betray him. And Jesus loved Judas, he loved them, said that earlier. Even the one who betrayed him, in fact, they had a meal together and shared, and Jesus included him. Even though he would later betray him and turn his back on him. It's a powerful picture of Jesus' love, no matter what you've done. Don't ever think, oh, I've, I'm too far away. Jesus would never forgive me for that. He, you know, like, he loves anyone and would forgive anyone. I think of the Apostle Paul. <laughs> He'd killed other Christians. He'd killed people. And Jesus forgave him. Anyway, it goes on and say in John chapter 13, and when, when he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and he returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you. Do, you. do you get this? It's like, this is really important. He asked him. Do you understand what just happened here? And he goes on to explain, you call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. I am teacher. I'm your rabbi. You've been following me, and I've been teaching you. You also called me Lord, because I am the Son of God who's come into the world, and rightly so. That's what I am. And all authority is under me. And guess, get this. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, has stooped down and washed your feet, you should wash one another's feet. Don't ever think that's beneath you. Are you willing to live low? Are you willing to adjust your posture to one of a servant? Jesus says in the next verse, verse 15, I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. In other words, Jesus didn't give us just the words. He lived it out. He did it. He took action. And he served them. He took the place of a servant. And then he says, very truly, anytime he says that at the beginning, it's like you're going to have a hard time believing this, but I'm telling you the truth. Here it is. No servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Guess what? You'll, <clears throat> I'll always be your master. You won't surpass me. But, but guess what? I can still serve. And I will still serve. In fact, I'll give my life for you. Now, now that you know these things, you will be blessed. 
You will be blessed if you do them. It doesn't say you'll be blessed because you know them, but if you do them. The proof is in the action. You put it into practice. Blessed, happy, fortunate. Life is best when you do this. And the blessing of God can flow into your life when you act like Jesus acted. What does that look like? It means, it means nobody, uh, that no, no act of, of service is too low for you. No, no act is beneath your dignity. No one is below you. It, it means that you're eager and ready to serve. It means that you're aware of the needs of people around you. It means that you pay attention to what's going on and look for opportunities to serve. It means that you live a remarkable life and, and display this attitude that people go, wow, he's really not in this for himself. This kind of person says no to selfishness and says no to anything that makes them look better and, and others look worse. It, this, this kind of attitude is never inflate, never elevate. Always ask the question, how can I help? Is there anything I can do? Never puts people down, but recognize they're people of value, that Jesus died for them too. You see, Jesus is saying there's a way to live. There's a Jesus way. And it's humbling. And it has nothing to do with your position, your power, your bank account. It's just everything to do with your posture and your position and how you live. And he's saying, I want you to live low. And so maybe we need to do a bit of a, uh, an analysis, a posture adjustment this morning. Maybe we need to think through, you know, in my life, how have I lived? Have I honored God? Have I lived? Jesus, I want to follow you. Well, if I want to follow you, then I need to live like you live. And isn't it, isn't it true that when we see this in others, we think, oh, well, that's, that's a great, what a great person. We admire people who live this way. We want to be like them. We want them around. We want to hire them in our, in our, our jobs. We want to work with people like this. We, we want our kids to be like this. We want kids to hang around people like this. We want our kids to marry people like this. We, we love this in other people. Well, then, why not in ourselves? And that's the question that we have to ask ourselves. If we're going to follow in the way of Jesus, Jesus says, it's, are you sure? It, it's about getting low. Are you willing to get low? Jesus finishes off uh, this with a very famous command. He says, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my apprentices. You are my disciples. You're my followers. If you love one another. You want to be known as a Jesus person following the Jesus way? Then your motivation is love. And you live low in love. That's how you do it. Imagine how much better life would be, families would be, churches would be, if we all chose to live this way. How the impact we could have? If we lived the Jesus way, a way of love and esteeming others. I want to close by going back to a verse that I started with, both today and in the first week of this series, in John 14, 6. And Jesus said, I am the way. I am the way. And when he said that, he said, later he said, no one comes to the Father except through me. Because I'm the way. And when he said that, he was emphasizing the fact that the way to God is through Jesus. Because Jesus did all the work at the cross. That's why he went and died for us at the cross. Because he loves you so much. 
He couldn't imagine eternity without you. And so he gave his life. And he served. And we admire him. And we think, and he's been, two, it's been 2,000 years, and we still talk about him all over the world, but it's way more than that. It's way better than that. Because he's offered us a gift, the forgiveness of sins. He'll wash away our, our sins, kind of pictured in baptism. He, he washes away our sins and, and calls us to follow him. And, and we can be forgiven completely, even today. And it's something you do by faith. Right? It's not, not, nothing magic about the water. It's just it's, it's by faith. And we just say, uh, Lord Jesus, I want and I choose to follow you. And by faith, we can become a follower of his. Uh, because he is the way to the Father. And no one comes except through him. And I wonder this morning, if you've been thinking about Jesus, you've been wondering about... <coughs> uh, Maybe you've had a lot of questions or maybe feeling somewhat lost in life and, or, or as, as Kim said, there's something really missing. Spiritually, there's a big piece of our life missing. And, and maybe you feel some of that too. And maybe today is the day uh, you discover Jesus and how he wants to fulfill and be there with you. Forgive your sin and invite you uh, into relationship with him. Let's close in prayer. Our Father in heaven, Lord, I just pray that if there is someone here this morning, first of all, who's never made that decision in their heart right now, they would just say, Lord Jesus, forgive me. I believe your son was, uh, was God, that he came and he died for me, and he rose again on the third day. And I believe that he did it because he wanted a relationship with me. He wanted to walk with me. And he wanted me in heaven with him. And so today, Lord, I give my heart to Jesus. Lord, maybe there's some people today that have been convicted because the way they have lived has been mostly about themselves and promoting themselves and spending money on themselves and their family. And they haven't given much to you into building the kingdom they realize today that the posture of life the, the lesson that Jesus burned into their hearts right before going to the cross was one of giving one of generosity one of serving others Lord burn that picture into our hearts too as we deal with others as we relate to others, as we speak with others. May we truly follow you. In Jesus' name, amen.